Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer. We are so glad you're here. If you will stand with us, we'll start our time of worship in song. For sinner, come cast off thy fear and raise thy drooping head. Come sing with all poor sinners here, Jesus who once was dead. Salvation, sing no word for me to join to Jesus' name. Let every thankful tongue repeat salvation to the Lamb. Salvation to the Lamb. From the garden to the cross, your conquering Lord pursue, who dearly to redeem your loss, from bled and died for you, now reigns victorious over death, the glorious great I am, let every soul repeat. To the Lamb, salvation to the Lamb. When we incurred the wrath of God, alas, what could be worse? He came and with his heart's own blood. Redeemed us from the curse, His Paschal and His blood can be, and cleanse it from each stain. Repeat, ye ransomed souls, repeat, salvation to the Lamb, salvation to the Lamb, salvation to the Lamb. Hallelujah, death has 
lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body. Welcome to Redeemer. We are glad you have joined us for worship this morning. Uh, a few announcements as we are getting started. This is our Holy Week, and there are still some things going on, actually a lot more things going on. Um, on Wednesdays, we will do the liturgy meeting at noon. You can join us at the Redeemer office, or you can also join by Zoom. Um, you can find that link in your email or um, online under the Lent at Redeemer tab in the app. And then we are going to have a corporate day of fasting that will start Thursday evening after you eat dinner, and that will last until Friday evening. And we are going to gather together on Friday evening out at the Dooley's Ranch to break that fast together. So if you would um, bring a side, that would be helpful. I think we're going to do some kind of barbecue sort of thing. Um, so a good side to go with that. And then if you will RSVP online so we have a head count as well. Also, then um, Thursday will be the Monday Thursday service. We will do that in conjunction with Westminster. If you're unfamiliar with Westminster, it is the church that planted us. They are in Bryan. And if you need any information on um, where to go or who's going, um, we would love to kind of get you plugged into that for Thursday evening. On Friday at noon, we will be doing a Good Friday service at Vision Mission. Um, and just watch for the signs for that if you haven't been to Vision Mission before. Um, but we will gather there Friday at noon. And then Sunday will be our sunrise service out at Veterans Park. And we will gather there at the pavilion that is kind of in the middle of the park. We will not do worship here on Sunday morning. That will be our only worship service. Um, I hope you've already thought of somebody to bring with you. Um, ask a family friend. Um, or neighbor. Um, we would love to see some new faces out there. Also, we're going to do breakfast after worship. If you would sign up to bring um, like some sort of like protein casserole or some sort of breakfast food, we will also be providing coffee and donuts and fruit. Um, so we would love for you to hang around afterwards and um, there'll be an Easter egg hunt and um, bunnies to pet. So uh, plan on hanging around after the worship service as well. So with that, if it goes to the next slide, we do need Easter eggs. Um, it's being, 
Okay, we do need Easter eggs. If you haven't already grabbed some Easter eggs, then we would love for you to bring some um, pre-filled Easter eggs that can be filled with anything of your choosing and just bring them next Sunday or you can drop them by my house or the Redeemer office. Just text me that you're going to do that. Um, I, I lost my connection to the slides, so I'll fix that here in a minute. But we're glad you're here with us this morning. The kids are going to sing. If you are visiting, um, there is a green card in the front of that visitor's welcome mat. If you want to fill that out and drop it into the offertory a little later. Otherwise, sign in, and we are glad you are here this morning. So welcome. John 12 says, The next day the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel. worship. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Please pray with me. Great Father in heaven, would you meet with us this morning? Would you care for us? Would you help us understand more deeply who you are? Would you pour out your mercy and grace upon us as we come to worship you? Lord, um, you are good, you are faithful, you are true. You are our King. Hosanna. We sing in Jesus' name. Amen.
glory in my Redeemer, whose priceless blood has ransomed me. I was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on that judgment tree. I will glory in my Redeemer who crushed the power of sin and death. My only Savior before a holy judge, the Lamb who is my righteousness, the Lamb who is my righteousness. He bought my love, he owes. I have no longings for another. I'm satisfied in him alone. I will glory in my Redeemer, his faithfulness, my standing place. The foes are mighty and rush upon me. Are firm held by his grace. My feet are firm held by his grace. I will glory in my Redeemer who carries me on eagle's wings. He crowns my life with loving kindness. Triumph song I'll ever sing. I will glory in my Redeemer who waits for me at gates of gold. And when he calls me, it will be paradise. His face forever to behold. His face forever to behold. I will glory in my Redeemer who waits for me at gates of gold. And when he calls me, it will be paradise, his face forever to behold, his face forever to behold. Will hold me fast. 
come now to our time of corporate confession of sin. We're going to be using the prophet Jeremiah to guide us. The Lord has spoken through the prophet Jeremiah saying, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his way, according to the fruits of his deeds. Let us then confess our sin saying, Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Now, if you would take a few moments for silent confession and reflection.
Now if you would lift up your, your heads and hear this assurance of pardon. I declare this sure promise. If anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you today to be before your throne. We know that you want us to bring you our prayers, to lay them at your feet so we can rejoice the praises we have and seek comfort for our troubles. This gives us the chance to trust in you, knowing that through your mercy and grace, you will provide the answers we need, even if they aren't always the answers we want. But we do this each and every day to allow you to work through us and with us and strengthen us for your purposes. Today, we remember the crowds many years ago as your son made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The crowds were chanting Hosanna for him as their king, yet not even a week later, they were chanting for Barabbas. How often we find ourselves in both positions in our lives. When we receive your blessings or find ourselves needing you, we exalt and praise you. However, when things may not go our way or we find ourselves in the midst of a trial, we often turn from you or turn on you. We try to take control of our own lives and our own circumstances. We pray that we recognize that in each of these situations, you are still at work in our lives. Come alongside us and lovingly guide us, letting us lean on you or share in our triumphs. Lord, we also thank you for your son. In our daily lives, we go from task to task, making it difficult to see a big picture. It makes us miss the chance to truly reflect on your role in our lives. This week, we pray that you give us opportunities to take time and reflect on the gift of your son and the price he paid for all of us. Give us occasions to think about the cross and what his sacrifice means to us every day, and give us openings to share the story of that gift with others. You promised us a Messiah, and he came just as you said. Father, we pray today for those spreading the gospel to others throughout the world. Your missionaries are called to leave their homes and venture into new places to work for your kingdom. We pray that they are comforted as they continue to work and that they encounter open hearts and minds to hear your message. We specifically lift up the Pekarics in Central Asia. We praise you for the successes that they have had and ask you continue to help them assimilate to the culture and language. We also pray for those in their community that are practicing Ramadan this month. As they are observing their own religious time of reflection, this week provides openings to have discussions with them and others about your son and the cross. Lord, we pray for similar opportunities here and occasions to share with others the gift of your son and what it means in our lives. Lord, while we reflect on our spiritual health this week, we also pray for our physical health. We acknowledge that you are our creator and sustainer. You know our frame and you know our needs. We come to you with the very fresh news and heartache that the Haley family has just received, that Beth has been diagnosed with early stage lung cancer. We pray you would meet her and the Haley family in these early hours and days. We know that every detail of scheduling, consultations, and potential treatments are in your hand. We ask for help, provision, and your presence. Give them peace when anxiety and doubt creep in, and give strength and courage to persevere when your spirit may waver. Most of all, we trust you and the promises that you have, and that you have made to Beth and her family and to each of us, that you preserve us in a way that without the will of you, our Heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from our heads. Thank you for the promises you have made, and that you have Beth and her family in your hand. Lord, we also pray for those experiencing emotional pain. Give strength and courage to face each day and hope to see that tomorrow brings better things. We pray for guidance, to be compassion companions, and come alongside and offer solace and understanding. Finally, Lord, we thank you for your unmerited mercy. As we take this time this week to reflect on the last events of your son's life, we solemnly thank you for his sacrifice. We are broken, but because of him, Find refuge in your arms. As we enter the Holy Week, help us realign our routines and focus on you, your Son, beginning today as we pray the prayer Jesus taught the disciples, saying, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done as it is in heaven. This day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We miss not to temptation. It's from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you again for the ability to come together and have a place to worship and do the work of your ministry. Lord, we pray that you would bless our tithes and offerings as you have just proven to us over and over that you're faithful. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so I realize about 75% of y'all in the room uh, knew we told... uh, core teams yesterday but um so y'all can ask us any questions um but the question that you might be saying right now is or y'all might be wanting to ask us right now is what do y'all need and beth gave a brilliant answer because she's brilliant she was like the answer is hugs just for today like we don't know what we need tomorrow (laughs) And y'all know, y'all heard me say that one of my former students who's now a professional counselor said, everyone eat eight eight hugs a day. So when you factor in something like lung cancer, I say, let's just double that. You know what I mean? And and we'll go with that. But um, again, just to preface, y'all can can talk to us and ask us uh, in that sort of thing. But if you'll hang with me this morning. I would like to preach the gospel uh, for us and to me and to y'all. So let's do that. Hey, if this is your first time at Redeemer, <laughs> welcome. My name is Ben Haley, and I'm the lead pastor here. And um, as Jamie said, we're a church plant from Westminster out of Bryan. And um, so glad to have you worship with us. If it's your first time, we, we want you to be refreshed and encouraged by the power and the love of Jesus in our lives. Um, We are all hanging on to Jesus for dear life. I think that's a good spot for all of us to be. Um, His words are abide. Mine are hang on to his pants leg. I'm along for the ride. Um, But we're so glad to have you uh, again with us in worship this morning. Uh, Next Sunday, just remember, we will not be here. We will be at Veterans Park, the pavilion that's right smack in the middle of the big park um, at 8 a.m. for a sunrise uh, worship service. So just keep up with your information. But I would love for you to pray today about three people that you can invite. And... 
I would, I'm, I'm going to pray for courage for you to reach out and say, hey, we, um, we got an Easter service coming up Sunday morning, and we would love to have you and your family. And so um, I would love for us all to do that. Uh, just think about three people that you can invite to our service next week. It, it's, it's, it's so much fun. It's so good. Uh, we've done it for several years uh, now. Okay. So uh, with that in mind, we're going to read uh, Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. I know 1 through 18 is on the thing, but I cut it down. We're going 1 through 11 this morning from, from Mark chapter 11. Um, and so uh, if you would f- follow along with me as I read for us. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who, were, who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of our father David. Coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. So, as many of you know, today is Palm Sunday. And this is why we began our service with our children uh, marching in, waving the palm branches, singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. And in many ways, uh, this is what Palm Sunday is all about. It's not only a recognition that Jesus is king, but it's also welcoming and celebrating that Jesus is king. And this is a big deal because you probably remember that throughout the Gospels, Jesus would tell his disciples over and over to be quiet, be quiet, not to tell anyone who he is. But on Palm Sunday, Jesus allowed the crowds to sing, to parade, to celebrate, and announce that he is king. Now, for us Americans uh, here in 2024, Palm Sunday is often cute. It's sweet. It's safe. It's clean. And, of course, we enjoy watching our children sing, and it's beautiful. And it really is. It, It really is. But the first Palm Sunday was not cute and sweet and safe and clean. It wasn't even overtly religious. It was actually an overt act of political revolution. And I bring this up not to like dunk on our uh, traditions, but to help us think what we are actually celebrating. So it's very important that we not divorce the historical Jesus from the historical context in this story and try to apply that historical Jesus and the modern context in which we live. Those are two different things. So you got to remember that first century Jerusalem was a Roman-occupied city, which meant that Roman soldiers, administrators, politicians filled the street. They were in charge, and they let you know that they were in charge. And their job was to keep the peace of Rome, to to enforce the Roman Empire. And in this historical context, Caesar was king. He was literally called the Soter, or the Savior. He was venerated as a god. And it was the exaltation of the Roman Empire that the citizens, not just of Rome, but everyone, everyone was called to honor and serve Caesar as king. 
And so to him and to, to him and to Rome belonged all the glory. So back in 2012, uh, I had the opportunity to go to Uganda. Uh, Wade and I went to do kind of a one-week intensive spiritual life week where we preached through the entire book of Mark in one week. Um, and, uh, you know, we got off the airport, and the airport is in this uh, city in Uganda called Entebbe. And the capital city is Kampala. And the, uh, the uh, Bible college that we were teaching now is in Kampala. So we get off the plane, and there's the, the best road in Uganda is the road from the airport to uh, Kampala. So we get, in, we get in our little, you know, the little bands, and I'm, you know, and um, I sit up front because I'm claustrophobic. Anyway, so I'm t- we're talking, we got about a 50-mile it's about a 50-mile ride from what I can remember. And I'm talking to the driver who picked us up, and uh, he's one of the students at the Bible college. And uh, he, he told me this story because I was noticing just like there was just people everywhere, and there was just, uh, you know, vendors everywhere along the road. And uh, he told me a story about Gaddafi. Okay, so Gaddafi was this, you know, Libyan dictator. Well, Gaddafi parked a ton of his money in Uganda for a long time. And the driver told me the story that when it was announced that Gaddafi was coming to town, people would line the road for 50 miles, cheering. And the billboards, just like our billboards, the billboards would have a picture of Gaddafi, and it would say, Welcome, King of Kings. Now, I got chills retelling that story. The first time he told me that story, I was like, that is idolatry. But this is kind of the historical context that we're talking about here. You see, citizens and everyone were called to honor and hail Caesar as the king of kings. But on Palm Sunday, the crowds of Jerusalem refused to lift their voices and their hopes to Caesar. And instead, they lifted their lives to Jesus as he made his way from the Mount of Olives to the city of Jerusalem. So, two points this morning. The king and the welcome. So, this event with the cult and the Psalms and Hosannas is not a random event. It is an incredibly intentional, symbolic, and biblical event. Now, as you understand this story, you need to understand and remember some of Israel's history. So, about 500 years prior to this Palm Sunday event, in 586, the Babylonians invaded Jerusalem, captured the king, destroyed the city, the temple, and put the Jews in exile in Babylon. And there they lived for about 70 years until they were allowed to go back to Jerusalem. And when they got back to Jerusalem, the Davidic kingdom was over. The walls of Jerusalem had been completely torn down. The temple was in ruins. They were being mocked and attacked by their neighbors. And while they were attempting to rebuild the city and the temple, this prophet named Zechariah began to write. And in his prophecy, he said that one day, the Messiah, the great king, the son of David, would enter. And in chapter 9, verse 9, Zechariah prophesies on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, and the people will rejoice and shout, your king is coming to you. And then in verse 16 and 17 of chapter 9, he says, the Lord their God will save them as the flock of his people For like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on his land. For how great is his goodness, how great is his beauty. Grain shall make the young men flourish, and new wine the young women. So think about this amazing prophecy to the people of Israel. Your king is coming. He will come on a colt. And when he comes, the people of God will rejoice. The land will be restored. The hungry will be fed. The tired will be refreshed. That which is tarnished will shine. Goodness flourishing will fill the land. Now, that's the prophecy that they heard 
as they had come back to a broken Jerusalem. Now fast forward about 500 years to Mark 11. And notice where Jesus is. The Mount of Olives. <laughs> My friend Sean says, now this is a big deal. Not just for the olives. But for what Zechariah had said would happen on the Mount of Olives. So Zechariah again. Chapter 14. Verse 4 through 9. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall split in two east from west by a very... The Mount of Olives shall split in two from east to west by a very wide valley. Verse 6. On that day there will be no light, cold, or frost. And there shall be a unique day that is known to the Lord, neither day nor night. But at evening time there shall be light. On that day living waters shall flow out of Jerusalem. Half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer and in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. So again, think about this. Zechariah is saying that the king of all the earth is coming. And when he comes, darkness will give way to light. The dry and the barren shall be refreshed and fruitful. The river of life will flow from the temple to give life to all the earth. All of it will begin on that day, on the Mount of Olives. So now fast forward back to Mark 11. Here Jesus with his feet on the Mount of Olives and he says, get the colt. And Jesus is saying, do you see what he's saying? He's saying, it's, it's go time. This is the day. All of God's promises have begun. Healing, forgiveness, renewal, life, the temple, the king, everything that God's people have been longing for is right in front of you. So when Jesus got up on that colt, everyone knew what Jesus was saying. This is the day. I am the king. So like, if I were to say to you, may the force be with you, all of a sudden images of Darth Vader and lightsabers and Luke and Leah and Jedi and Millennium Falcon, all those images would come to your mind if I say the force be with you, right? All those images come to your mind. So when Jesus stands on the Mount of Olives and says, get the colt, all, he's saying all the promises of God, and particularly those promises from Zechariah, are flashing now. Everybody, lights going off. Oh, Zechariah moments. Because through his actions, Jesus is saying, look, I'm your king, and not just any king, but I am the forever Davidic king coming to make everything right. And this is how everyone understood what was Jesus was doing. So in verse 8, they spread their cloaks, they spread leafy branches. In other words, they rolled out the red carpet for him and waved the royal banners before him. And they began to shout, Hosanna, meaning God save. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Now, you may not know this, but they are singing Psalm 118 at the top of their lungs. And this is important because Psalm 118 is considered what we call a royal psalm to celebrate the day of salvation. And so in light of Zechariah's prom prom promises, them singing Psalm 118 is perfect because they are saying this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it because God saves because the King has come. So what Palm Sunday is showing us first is that Jesus, excuse me, is the promised forever king before whom we all must bow, we all must serve. And from his temple, the river of light and life will fill the earth. You remember Jesus' claim about the temple? He's the temple. And so the crowd welcomes him. So that's point two. Point one, the king. Point two, the welcome. The crowd welcomes him, and so must we. Now it's very important for us to consider the risk that these crowds are taking. Because they're welcoming Jesus. They had turned their back on Caesar. They lifted their voices to celebrate a new king. They waved his banner and welcomed him into the city. And this could have easily been seen as treason or sedition. 
The Roman soldiers could easily have begun to silence their voices. But the promises of God gripped their hearts. And their allegiance had moved from Hail Caesar to Hosanna in the highest. Jesus is king. And what this means is that you must either crown Jesus or kill him. You see, this is not a parade you can intend without consequences. It's not like going to St. Patrick's Day Parade and waving at some floats or getting your candy. I grew up going to Mardi Gras parades all the time, getting the doubloons, right? It's not like that kind of parade where you can just, you know, pinch a few people and go home. To participate in Palm Sunday is to declare your allegiance to God and to His Messiah. It is to publicly proclaim that we serve Jesus, that we honor Jesus, that we love Jesus, that we obey Jesus, that He is our life. And here's a proclamation to the world that Jesus is King and Savior and there is no other. He is the King. Are you willing to publicly identify with Jesus? That's the point of Palm Sunday. Who is your king? Who or what rules your life? I mean, this is what the disciples had to do. He was their king. They had to obey him. So in verse 2, Jesus said, Go to the village, get a colt. Anyone ask you, why are you doing this? Says the Lord, why are you doing this? Say the Lord has need of it and we'll send it back here immediately. So they did. Verse 4, they went and found the colt. Verse 6, they told them what Jesus has said. Do you see what's happening? They are doing what Jesus told them to do. His word is the word of the Lord. And then in verse 9, they went before him and they followed after him. They were identifying him as their king. They were announcing you are our king. They praised him, verse 9 and 10. They sang, they confessed him. They were essentially worshiping him as the forever promised king. And they did all of this at the risk of their lives. Because remember, they are in Roman occupied Jerusalem, and this is treason. But this is what we are called to do to announce, to proclaim, to confess that Jesus is Lord. This would be like walking into Mecca, proclaiming Jesus is king. This would be like going to Wall Street and saying, Jesus is king, not money. This is, this is like going to D.C. and claiming Jesus is king, not America. But why? Why would we give our complete allegiance to him? So I want to answer this in a couple of different ways. One is just matter of fact. We give our allegiance to Jesus because he is true. That's what we believe as Christians. That's what Jesus believed about himself. This is what Christians have always believed, that, that God is real, that God's word is trustworthy, and that Jesus is the embodiment of God's word. He has come into the world as the fulfillment of all His promises. And He not only created the world by the power of His Word, but He also upholds the, power, the world by the power of His Word. And He makes things new according to His Word, just like He has made you new. You see, we give our allegiance to Jesus because we fundamentally believe that Jesus' kingship is the truest thing in your life. But secondly, and this may be more psychologically, we give our allegiance to Jesus because we want Him to be our King. Years ago, David Foster Wallace said, pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things... If they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough and never feel have enough. It's the truth. Worship your body, your beauty, your sexual allure. You will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing you, when time and age start showing, 
You will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. But let's go back to the original context or think more politically. Think about the governments of this world. We like to pretend that they exist for the good of the people. Show me a government that's doing that. Show me a system that has not collapsed in upon itself to keep control and sabotage its enemies. Show me a country whose people really, really believe their leaders have their best interests in mind. Show it to me. You see, we want a king that will protect us and provide for us. So think about like military parades, right? Super cool. Tanks, legions of soldiers marching in step, beautiful uniforms, big guns, black hawks, whatever. Right? To, to, to show our power, to show off our cool stuff. And these parades are meant to encourage you, saying we will protect you, right? North Korea has one like every five minutes. You know, we will protect you. They will also say, if you get out of line, we will kill you. And notice how the passage ends. Verse 11, he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. Well, what happens at the temple? Sacrifice, communion with God. What does Zechariah say would happen when the king came? That living waters would flow from the temple in Jerusalem? You see, Palm Sunday is actually meant to prepare us for Good Friday. Because on Palm Sunday, Jesus came down from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem. And on Good Friday, Jesus went from the temple to the hill of Golgotha as a king. As a king. He willingly died. And on the cross, from his hands and his feet, and a side, and his side, a river of life began to flow. A river that offers forgiveness, not revenge. A river from his body, the temple that offers life, not death. A river that offers freedom, not slavery. And that's what our king is like. He is a king who gives himself for all who serve him. And that's what this table is about. This table. Kings demand taxes and gods demand offerings. Your idols, they cost you way more than they promise. They promise way more than they give you. Our king freely gives himself. This table is one taste of his generosity. The king's body, the king's blood, given to forgive. And the king says, come to my table, come with nothing. Let me feed you, let me nourish you, let me give you true and eternal life. Because this table is a foretaste of the king's table where we will feast with him forever. And we rejoice today in the king who actually welcomes us. Please pray with me. Father, Thank you for your words for us. Thank you for your love for us. Would you meet with us now as we come to your table? And we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
We praise You, O Lord, that You, rich in mercy, infinite in goodness, made us in Your own image, freed us from everlasting death, provided our redemption in Your only and well-beloved Son, whom out of love You gave to be made man, like us in all things but sin, to receive the punishment of our transgressions in His body, to satisfy Your justice by His death, and through His resurrection to destroy Him who was the author of death, And so to bring again the world, the life from which the whole offspring of Adam was exiled. And so, at the commandment of Jesus Christ our Lord, we present ourselves at this His table. For on the night when Jesus was betrayed, He took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and gave it to His disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper... He took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, Drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place, as this bread is Christ's body for us. Send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. All of this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by Him, with Him, in Him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Lord Almighty, Father, now and forever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Christ is risen. Let's take and eat and drink.
not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, His words are paid by ransom. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give Good and true and righteous, and He loves you. He's proven that to you. You might have a lot of questions about why God does things the way He does them. I don't know. But He doesn't have to prove Himself to me. He already did. Take and eat. We believe that when we take this cup together as God's people, the Holy Spirit does His thing. I don't know how, but He's with us. And as we take this cup, rivers, rivers of life, take and drink. Now, if you would, please stand. Now the God who is from everlasting to everlasting, who has loved you with an everlasting love and gives you eternal life, now support you with everlasting arms in these days and all the days until Jesus comes. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here be. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. We got cancer, but we have the peace of God beyond. That is the bottom line. That we are anchored in the peace that Christ has secured between us and Him and the peace that we have with one another. So let's extend that peace to one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Also with you. Now extend that peace. Hey, hey, we got college lunch today.